Hello. Hello. So let's get to the next talk. Um, hello, world. <laughs> um, yeah, so I have to put it very close. Okay, good. So um, I don't think I have to introduce myself. Uh, so you can just read uh, down there uh, what I did. Um, and I want to start this talk uh, with statements. Uh, actually, two statements. The first statement is, I think that in 2019 it will be all about Web3 UX. This is kind of like a very important thing we have to tackle, and the problem with this is that Web3 UX right now is hard. You know, it's all about you know looking into the car's engine and while making people drive the car, but first explaining them how the engine works and filling gas and changing oil and so on. That's one problem. The second statement that's that's probably a total gamble, but I I. I my gut feeling says that this will uh, be the case, is that 2020 we probably will see mainstream adoption. Meaning people are using blockchain without knowing that they're using blockchain and it will be used by the non-technical audience, which right now uh, is mostly the technical audience. And we have two main problems which come with using the Ethereum network or technically using any blockchain. And the main things are gas. The problem with gas is you want to do anything on the blockchain and you have to figure out what the thing Ether is. Especially for the newcomers in the space, that's a very big problem. Because they come in, they want to use their token, I want to move a token, and then they have to figure out, oh, I need Ether first. But nobody told them before, right? So the gas problem is a pretty big deal of why the UX is so bad. The second thing is everything is on keys. So losing your keys basically means losing access to whatever assets you have. So it's all based on uh, you have different keys generated and then you need to transport them and need to back them up and all of these things. This kind of like kills the whole UX when you're interacting with the blockchain. Here's the 7 to 5, which is this uh, proposal I made a year, two years ago or so, um, a year ago I think which was all about, okay, how can we interact better on chain, how we can basically be more, more recognizable, how we can better manage uh, a profile on chain. The problem is, it was rather complicated. It's a very complex standard, like tries to involve a lot of different pieces, and even though that this is, this is a problem, you know, if you come with complex standard, it showed everybody, okay, what could be the different components, and it spurred a rather lively discussion uh, around uh, anything identity on chain and uh, in, in general in Ethereum around identity. It even led to an alliance forming and some whatever 30 projects saying that they want to use that standard. The problem is it was not good enough. <laughs> and um, therefore we, we sat together in fact I and Taylor sat together and like we thought, okay, what exactly, how exactly could this look like? What is the core piece and what's the core component of making a profi profile on-chain work? And the key to that is you make it extremely simple. That's kind of probably also what made ERC20 uh, successful. It was extremely simple. Now, with this simplicity here, which looks like not, like not much, right? You have to like, uh, get data and a set data, so you can set data into a smart contract, and you can get data in a smart contract, and you have an owner, and you can execute, meaning talk through this uh, smart contract. And it has an execute function, yeah? So this kind of solves actually a lot of problems, if you think about it. It solves actually very many problems. And in fact, I remember, um, back in the day in 2000 and whatever it was, 15 or so, we met uh, in Amsterdam as the MIST team for the first time. Uh, everybody's been together. We had the first version of the Ethereum wallet and the MIST browser. Uh, early on, uh, I built a Whisper chat application which used the Whisper protocol back in the day. 
and we were thinking, okay, how should we have uh, our accounts in the Mist browser? Yeah, and uh, the, actually Jeffrey, the founder of Go Ethereum, said, yeah, we have to. This cannot be keys. Not at all keys. We have to have smart contracts. We have to have like smart contracts which you put out there, and then the keys interact with that. The problem is. You have then all of these problems, like who's paying for the gas, who's deploying them, when, and all of these things. So we decided, okay, let's make it easy. Let's just you know, use the keys as, as an identifier uh, and the one you use in a, on, on chain. In fact, looking now back, he was completely right. He actually already clearly saw it. And, and over the time, you know, um, kind of like ESS 75 and others kind of led to this. And I guess this is kind of what ESS 75 now, as a result, really brings to the table. And the benefit of this is, if you have a proxy account or a smart contract which you interact with, you can have an owner of the smart contract. And this means you can abstract away the keys, meaning you can start out having your proxy account and you have just one key, and the key owns that account, this proxy account. The moment you actually want to have a backup, you know, you want to show your user, for example, Okay, now you have an account, you purchased something, we put it onto your proxy, but now you should back it up. Hey, we sent you one key via email, either encrypted or not encrypted even. Like for most of these values, it doesn't even matter. But this way, you have a backup, and you haven't even probably set a password. But you have a backup, and the moment you lose your phone, happened pretty often. And we are at the level of email uh, password recovery, like which is the standard today, right? But when you want to have more security, you now can have a more complex mechanism. You could uh, have multiple type of keys, and you could assign different roles for these keys. If you are a corporation, you could even say, OK, we have here now five keys, which certain employees get, and they can only call certain functions through that proxy account. Meaning, on-chain is always one address acting, which could be the, 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 the corporation acting. But any kind of employee can have different rights while talking through the same address. And the most, and I think the most important benefit is that we can add also relay transaction functionality or meta transaction or whatever we are calling this, um, which allows anybody to pay for the gas for your transaction. Meaning you just sign the message with one of your keys, you send it to a relayer. However, that relay service is paid if it's a free service or if he like somehow gets a reimbursement over time, but he's paying for a transaction uh, that might just be the startup. This might just be the application itself you're using, and you don't have to bother about any kind of transaction fees, especially not for first and early users. Like, nobody can use an application and first have to go to uh, an exchange and uh, register KYC, all of these things just to use an app, right? That kind of solves it, and that make, solves it nicely for that user profile you're creating here. On the other hand, you can now attach an all kind of information to this account. And this means you can make this account in some form identifiable or in some form verifiable. You could attach all kind of uh, information, like for example, you could attach different claims. I, this is, would have been in this case probably public claims or you reference any kind of secret claim registries with your public profile. And it can also be other, uh, other objects, but it can also be any kind of reputation systems. So if you want this account to be uh, reputable, or if you want this account to be uh, validatable by a smart contract, you can just attach it right here, and the smart contract can then go look, OK, uh, some kind of profile is talking to me. Let's check if he has whatever I require. If he has, let him in or not. That doesn't mean it's related to anything personal or, or even you have to know whoever is behind it, but you know you can interact with this account for whatever purpose or reason. So it's creating that thing which I call a manageable verifiable account. And that's kind of like a very key piece which we currently are missing because currently everything in the Ethereum and actually every blockchain ecosystem is about keys. And these keys are have no information attached, and they are pretty hard to manage <laughs> because they're only like locked, basically only manageable by its private key. So this creates this kind of proxy account that allows you to interact on chain with everything else without that you have to worry about losing your key or because you can have whatever recovery mechanism, be it social, be it multiple keys, be it, be it multiple devices whatsoever. 
And you could actually deploy this as a uh, uh, proxy account or as a library, meaning you pay 32,000 gas, in, in fact, if you want to have a very cheap account. So uh, stating that to you, Port, <laughs> actually. <laughs> um, it's actually not necessarily identity. It's, in fact, your proxy account. This is your actor on-chain. Right now, your actor on-chain is a key. Now your actor on-chain can be a more complex system where the key itself doesn't matter so much. And that's, that's the main thing. If you want to do real-world people's identity, you probably actually want to go use the DID spec from the W3C and actually just spent the, the last weekend at the uh, reboot of Web of Trust 8 in Barcelona. A lot of these kind of like standards around DID are discussed. So yeah, it's all about proxy account. And if we agree on a very basic, simple version of how that proxy account can look like, and how you interact, then we are free to attach any kind of key management to it. We are free to attach any kind of piece of information to it. And uh, the experimentation can start from there, but at least we can agree to the core. And that's the key piece, agreeing to the core. And as it is so simple, that's not really hard to do. And it solves a lot of problems and a lot of UX. And we can finally have the Web3 experience, which can be a lot easier than the Web2 experience currently is. So that's, that's all I have to say. Thank you. There's one question here. Thank you. Uh, before this talk, I was a bit confused before, because we used the ERC-725 for key management, and it proved very useful. And I believe you wanted to replace it with this proxy, which makes sense, but it's a different usage. Now I understand that the two will work together in kind of a pair, where you've got key management and then the proxy. So my question is, why keep the old name for the new proxy and give a new name for the key management and not the opposite? It's confusing for you knowing 725. It's probably less confusing for the pe pe people coming new. Uh, in fact, when I created 725 and 735, which is the claim, uh, the personal claim registry, I had to create one extra issue in order to get to like 25 and 35. Uh, and I created 34, which is an empty issue which fit perfectly now because uh, I moved the 725 key management into 34. <laughs> so yes, uh, it's, it's a bit confusing because um, now the proxy is 7 to 5, uh, 3, 4 is the key management the way it was, uh, which can talk to that. Uh, we have probably to do a little bit of improvements there. And 7, uh, 7 3, 5, the claim registry is just something you can link here. You could also link a 780 registry, or you could link a Merkle root hash of whatever off-chain claims, or you could even link just your DID, uh, your DID number or whatever you want. Um, why replacing that? Uh, the thing is, seven to five is already something people like talk about. It's like a word. It's a name. You know. I mean, if I would have created a new number, that would just lead to even more confusion. And on the um, other hand, it was in draft. And the whole point is, we have here standards that are supposed to be evolving and improving. And draft means it's not final. So I have to write kind of like to change it all over again. And that's uh, I think what makes totally sense here and is important. And and that's better to work on one standard, evolve that until we all finally think it's, it's final, rather than constantly creating a new standard. You know? like I see this so often now that like, somebody comes up with a standard, somebody doesn't like a detail, but instead of like, changing this or improving this, he just creates another standard. So you end up with this mess of like, standards around the same thing, which are only slightly different. So the whole point is like, let, let one evolve until it makes the most sense. Just as I comment on what you just said, it's completely different interface, right? So it already creates a confusion if you have two completely different interfaces under the same name. Uh, my question is uh, about uh, claims and about uh, what we put into the, in the new version, what we presented, yes, we have the set data and the get data. Would it make sense to uh, add uh, some kind of uh, uh, confirmation uh, into what we set? So uh, it will be like well packed and preserve some, um, how to say, split between 
uh, what the identity claims to be and what he puts in. Because currently, yes, I, uh, with the design what you, uh, you presented, I can put anything I want, but then a third party, he will, in any case, he will always need to check if what, what I put makes sense. So he needs to have, he always will need to have a, a, a second contract, yes, to, uh, to verify this claim, that claims. Yeah, so to the first part, I mean, 7 to 5 is actually not really used in production anywhere. People are worked on it, and there were some interfaces being built, I, but I'm not aware that anybody's using it in production. So uh, 7.5, or 7.25, sorry, 7.5. 7.25 version 1, um, in my opinion, it was not that much of a risk to replace it. Okay. Um, the, the answer to what you're saying here, the whole point is to keep the core extremely simple. This is just a reference point. That's your proxy. So whatever key management can talk to that. And the key management have to define of um, you know, uh, what kind of rules you invent to set data, what kind of rules you invent to, to call the execute function. So that's all managed now in the key manager, which can evolve over time and you can replace it. So only the owner, only that one owner address is able to call set data and is able to call execute. Yeah, that's right. But Any kind of confirmation or information you attach, they, this is sitting in a separate smart contract, which is a 780 contract. It might be a 735 contract. It might be a Merkle tree. It may be something with like a zero knowledge proof or whatever. So that's sitting outside. So you're not looking for the actual claims with confirmation within here. If somebody says, okay, yeah, but I want to put this on the 7 to 5 contract and comes up with whatever schema of how you read the bit masks of the, the value store, they could do that. Um, but the idea is not that now this is regulating what to trust. It's just the, the it's in, like in DID world, it's the DID. It's the point where you go look and find all the other things. Yeah, but if you talk about the usability, then let's say I'm a bank and I would like to, and you are coming to me and presenting, oh, this is my identity. So instead of using a, a one identity contract, now I need to deal with uh, several other contracts which will verify uh, what you try to present to me. So, I mean, this could be as simple as one call, uh, and this call is redirected once to another smart contract. So it can be done really simple. In the end, this, this, is, not, this is just defining the core data structure and not the UX. And however the UX is, I mean, the UX can be as easy as me pressing confirm, which signs a message, proves that they own and control this smart contract, and they go look wherever they need to look automatically. And this can be just as going to one next other smart contract. But the problem is, if we try, and this is exactly what 7 to 5 tried to initially do, what in my th opinion was the biggest fault is that it tried to do too much in one thing and therefore make it really hard to adopt. Because do we now figure out all the best solutions what, of what key management can be or what confirmation process can be? Um, probably not. We would have to discuss for another five years before we figure out it was a good or a bad idea. This allows extreme flexibility, meaning the way of how we confirm certain things can evolve over time. You don't have to change your address. You don't lose the reference point. Yeah. The reference point can always out exist all of these changes, and that's yeah. kind of the point. I agree for this. Uh, so let me just formulate the last question here. And in your opinion, from the architectural perspective, if we design some system to, to deal with the identities. Uh, so let's say for the bank perspective, yes, how would you design uh, the, um, uh, the confirmation system that when somebody is coming with the identity, he is also needs to have this uh, verification of these claims. So there will be always at least two contracts yes, to deal with. Yeah, so the thing is, the question is also what is the use case? This is, the, this is your door to the Ethereum blockchain or to any kind of EVM-based blockchain. If you're dealing about like credentials which maybe need to be verified from a bank, I mean, maybe the DID approach and the UPOL approach is the way you want to look at because that's probably what you want to deal with. Uh, you don't necessarily need to have anything of this on chain if you want to be verified. If you're an ICO smart contract, maybe there's a claim that you're a verified uh, investor or whatever that might help you to automatically interact with this ICO. But um, apart from that, I think most of these things can happen off-chain. But anything on-chain, you probably want to have some kind of gateway proxy, which is 7 to 5 version 2. So DIDs would be the answer to your own question. <laughs> DIDs and verifiable claims. That's what the, the W3C is specifying. And then 
<laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> hey, first of all, Fabian, I love the renaming. You know I would, and uh, it's awesome. Uh, and it is a, it looks, I'm mo so much happier with, with this. Uh, and I, all I wanted to say is for um, our did method at Uport, the etherdit method, I think this would work perfect. It would just interoperate completely without any kind of problem. So, uh, so, no, nice one. Thanks. Thanks. Okay, that's it then. No questions anymore. No. Good. Thank you.